most polyphenols and plant compounds are actually plant defense chemicals. They're plant defense chemicals. They're called phytoalexins. So forophane is a phytoalexin. Resveratrol is a phytoalexin. Resveratrol is a molecule that plants make to defend themselves against insects and fungus. It's not a molecule that plants make to benefit an animal eating them. So we just need to remember that these are molecules that plants are making for themselves. The broader context that I try and elaborate for people is the idea that these are different operating systems. We kind of touched on that in the beginning. Plants have a way of doing things and animals have a way of doing things. And these are very different and never the twain shall meet. These are really like computer operating systems. You have Mac and you have PC and you can decide whichever one, which one is human, whatever your bias is. I think of humans as Macs and plants as PCs. That shows you where my bias is because I have a Mac. But there are different operating systems. So plants are kind of doing their thing. They're doing their biochemistry. They're using polyphenols and plant molecules for defense purposes usually. Sometimes they are pigments. Flavonoids are another part of the polyphenol family and they're often pigments. But people need to realize these molecules are not designed for animals by plants. This is not a symbiotic relationship. There are symbiotic relationships in nature. This is not one of them as far as we know. The carnivore diet is the hottest thing really since the ketogenic diet. And many of you following this channel for a while know that at first, you know, I was pretty doubtful. I was pretty skeptical of the carnivore diet. And thanks to people like Sean Baker, my friend Danny Vega, and now Paul Saladino have helped me better understand who the carnivore diet is for, who can benefit from this, and different reasons why it might be helpful. So as you listen to this video, understand that I was the most skeptical person of the carnivorous diet, you know, to be totally honest. And again, Amber O'Hearn has been another one who I've been following to help me better understand this. So try to have an open mind wherever you are in the spectrum and realize that sometimes I've overconsumed plants thinking that they're helpful and as a result have had GI issues. But I kind of ignored that thinking, well, I'm getting these polyphenols, I'm getting these fibrous compounds. And perhaps we've overestimated some of the health benefits of plants. And again, I'm not anti-plants, you know, we have a garden back there, you know, we recommend plants, but I just, again, want you to keep in mind, have a, have a beginner's mind when you learn this and think about this and try to think about GI issues that you might have and possibly foods you're consuming that could contribute to that. So it's a great show, friends, brought to you by our pals over at juve.com. They're the leaders in photobiomodulation, which is a big fancy way of talking about how light affects our biology. I'm a huge believer in the juve light, as is Dr. Paul Saladino. I would suggest checking out the products over at juve.com for chest mic. The products I recommend are the Juve Go Travel Unit. It's a great way to get into photobiomodulation to see if you can make it part of your lifestyle and also to spot treat lingering injuries like if you have knee soreness, knee pain, skin issues that you want to address, things like that, you can use the portable Juve Go. We personally in our home, and I know Dr. Saladino has as well, the Juve Elite, which is a modular. It's one of the biggest units they offer because sometimes my wife is doing the therapy, sometimes I'm doing it. So we can actually both get in there and get full body exposure. The Juve Light and photobiomodulation is like anything in life. The more consistent you are with it, the more you're gonna get the benefits. So I recommend, if you're gonna give it a try, which I do recommend, be very consistent for the first 90 days, getting 10 to 12 minutes of full body exposure to the Juve Light. I like to recommend standing about three inches away from it, pretty close, but not too close, and that can enhance some of the benefits. So again, you can support your own body's mitochondria and enhance photobiomodulation within your tissues by going to juve.com for chest mic. So let's cut back to it with Dr. Paul Saladino and talk all things carnivore diet. And please have an open mind as you listen to this podcast. Maybe we can start kind of big picture and go more and more narrow. Um, so is it that plants are bad or is meat just more nutritious? Like if we were to try and talk big picture to someone who didn't believe in this whole movement, what would you? It's both. Yeah. And there's this hashtag in the space, meat heals. And I think that's only half the story. I, I really don't think there are any magical qualities about meat. But I mean, this is actually a chapter in my book that I'm writing this week. If you look at the nutritional content of meat, if you look at the bioavailability of nutrients in meat, it is just amazing. And we're not, we shouldn't be surprised because animals look a lot like humans in terms of their biochemistry, in terms of the cofactors that they use, you know, in their, in their daily life, in their 
molecular processes, they use all the minerals and vitamins that we use. Yeah. It's essentially the same operating system as a human. So when we're eating them, we're getting information, nutritional information, we're getting molecules and nutritional information that's much more compatible with our own biology than a whole different kingdom away, than the plant kingdom. And there are multiple examples of this, whether we're talking about beta carotene and vitamin A, whether we're talking about niacinamide and nicotinic acid, whether we're talking about alpha linolenic acid and DHA. What I'm illustrating here are examples of plant and animal compounds, basically forms of the same sort of molecule or the same compound, whether it's you know, a vitamin A derivative like beta carotene and vitamin A, whether it's niacin, which can be nicotinamide or, ni or ni ni it can be nicotinic acid or niacinamide, or the omega-3 family of compounds which start out in plants as alpha linolenic acid and then get converted into EPA, DPA, and DHA in animals. There's at a much lower percentage. Right? right, 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 at a much lower percentage. And so if you look at it, the bioavailability and the forms of the nutrients in animals are just much more compatible with humans. If you were to eat an animal, nose to tail, this is my strong belief, you would get everything that a human needs to function optimally. The flip side of that equation is also interesting. Plants don't want to get eaten. They're just rooted in the ground and plant and animal evolution has been happening for 450 million years, long before primate evolution. There were insects and animals eating plants. And if plants didn't get smart, I think plants are very smart, if they didn't have an evolutionary trend toward developing anti-nutrients, things to dissuade insects, other animals from eating them, the ecosystem of the earth would collapse. There has to be this kind of delicate balance where some animals eat plants, but they can't eat all the plants because the plants need to respire, they need to do the photosynthetic process, they need to fix carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into carbohydrate, which the animals eat. And the animals need to eat that and release the carbon dioxide and there's this process. And so there has to be this delicate balance between all of it. So that the plants have to stick around. They can only be eaten a little bit. And the animals similarly realize that they probably shouldn't eat all the plants or if they, they feel dissuaded in some way because of the toxins in the plants. And so you get to this really interesting thing that happened. You can imagine primate evolution, 35 million years of primate evolution. The size of the brain and primates stayed about the same from what we can tell based on the fossil record. None of it's perfect you know, 300 to 600 cc's of brain compartment in a primate. And then something about four to, well, maybe two and a half million years ago, something happened and Homo habilis showed up, Homo erectus showed up, probably connected with Australopithecus. It's not clear, I think, whether Australopithecus evolved into Homo habilis and Homo erectus or whether they were different lineages, but something happened in the primate lineage. And I think that a lot of people would agree that that was eating animals. So for some reason, we stopped eating plants, we started eating animals, and the human brain just really exploded in size. It got much, much bigger. It grew from 600 or 400 cc's to 1,000 cc's in a couple of million years, in like a million years or 1.5 million years, and then in the last 500,000 years, it's grown even more up to a magnitude of 1,500 cc's. So there was some difference in the way that we were eating food. We stopped eating plants as much. We started eating more animals. In fact, a lot of people believe we were eating almost exclusively animals. And so something happened in that sort of plant and human to plant animal interaction, because this is a question I get a lot. Primates were eating plants, but humans, maybe humans shouldn't be eating plants, or at least that's the hypothesis that I would posit. And I think it had to do with the fact that our brains got so much bigger because we started eating animals. And because we suddenly got access, we probably got smart enough and strong enough big enough and developed shoulders that were agile enough to actually hunt animals. And when we did that, we allowed our brains to grow because of this large amount of nutrients. And then when we don't need the plants anymore, I think that we lose the ability to eat them in such a way that we had before. And we kind of lose our adaptations and we lose our sense of which plants to eat when. And we clearly had changes in our gut. So this gets into this idea of the expensive tissue hypothesis, the fact that our colon shrunk our small intestine got much bigger and our brains got much bigger. So we sort of became less adapted to plants and people have talked about this frequently, the fact that chimps and apes spend all day chewing and they have these large colons which ferment the fiber over and over and they create all these short chain fatty acids. And this interesting idea that primates are actually kind of on a fat based metabolism when they're eating all this fiber because they're making it into fat in their gut. But clearly there was a change in what we were adapted to do. We became, I would argue, animal hunters instead of plant hunters. And 
with that transition from plant hunting to animal hunting, there were transitions in terms of our biochemistry, our adaptation to eating plants, and it seems that the plant toxins began to affect us much and much more than they had before. So they become a little more toxic over time. I think that throughout human evolution, we've eaten some plants, but I think that what makes most sense to me and a lot of other people is that maybe it was just during times of starvation, like a facultative carnivore approach. We know that if we eat plants, we don't die on the spot now. Right. Certain plants, perhaps, but... Maybe not I, optimal or ideal. Exactly, that it's probably not optimal or ideal. And then this interesting argument, this interesting hypothesis arises that perhaps animal foods are the optimal foods for humans. We can eat plants during times of starvation, but really the best food we can get with all the nutrients that are bioavailable that's not gonna have any of the toxins in the plants. It's just eating the whole animal, eating nose to tail. So it's kind of both. So, so the basic premise, would you say, I mean, if someone was doubtful, is that humans are less evolved or, or natural selection of the environment selected for us to better be able to tolerate animal foods as opposed to plant foods. And this maybe happened 30, 40,000 years ago, roughly. I would say even 2 million years ago, okay. you know, throughout our, our evolution, because if you look back, I mean, if you look at the fossil record, these are all interesting and they're all just kind of this anthropology, this paleoanthropology stuff. There's records, there's fossil record of 70, 80,000 years ago, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens from Northern Europe. And you look at the collagen structures in those, anim in those humans and Neanderthals and the amount of um, stable isotopes, they specifically use nitrogen, uh, was so high in the collagen tissues that it, most people argue that they're essentially high level carnivores. Because as you're eating more, of animals, you accumulate different nitrogen isotopes. And you can look at collagenous tissue, that is bones of 80,000 year old Neanderthal skeletons, and get a sense of what they were eating. And mostly they were eating animals because the amount of nitrogen was so high in those bones, it was higher than other known carnivores, like hyenas. Bones of hyenas are preserved in caves, things like this. So we can look and say, well, the hyenas have a certain amount of nitrogen in the bones, a specific isotope of nitrogen. And the Neanderthals had even more. And the Homo sapiens had even more. So we were eating bigger animals and we were probably eating almost exclusively animals. So, and I would argue that it probably went further back from that. And there's all sorts of paleoanthropology theories about the extinction of megafauna. Miki Bendor has talked about this, how if you look at the tracking of megafauna throughout the continents and the size of animals, wherever humans went, and again, this was probably 70, 80,000 years ago when Homo sapiens arrived sort of out of Africa and started moving around the world, we saw the extinction of the megafauna. We were hunting these big animals. But I think that even before that, we were eating lots of animals and becoming less and less adapted to eating plants if we were only eating them during times of starvation and not ex relying on the, them exclusively like our primate ancestors were. Right. So like in the summer, would if you were to hypothesize, you know, hunter-gatherers, would they walk by blueberries and say, I'm not going to eat those? Would they eat... I mean, the, the limited available fruit they would have because it's not cultivated, right? And so they're not big apple trees and all these different things. So, um, you know, because if you look at like Lauren Cordain's research and I, we kind of talked the other night, uh, Jeff Leach, he's studying uh, unindustrialized people in Tanzania. He, he's been observing these people and some of the children do eat roots and tubers and things like that. So it's maybe not the preferred fuel, but it's still kind of being consumed, maybe low allergenic type vegetables. I mean, and I think there's a lot of nuance there. Sure. That many of the plants that we consume today are high allergenic or high toxin. You know, they're stems and seeds and leaves. And for, I think, as currently living hunter gatherers in Tanzania have figured out, there are some roots that are a little less toxic. Now, when I interviewed Miki Bendor on my YouTube channel, one of the things he pointed out is that it's a little bit difficult to look at existing hunter gatherers and make conclusions about where we've come from because the landscape is not the same. And those hunter gatherers are really limited by laws. They can't go out and kill the elephants anymore. It's illegal. They can't go kill things anymore. They're kind of limited. So they may be eating more plants. And I think Lauren Cordain has argued this. They're eating 50-50 plant and animal. But Miki Bendora makes this very compelling argument like, well, hey, they're not living 30,000 years ago. There's a wildlife game ranger, you know, telling them what they can eat. And they don't have access to the animals in the same way they would have. But I think you're absolutely right. And you're hitting on the point that there's probably a hierarchy of food quality a hierarchy of nutrient availability, and animals are very clearly at the top of that. So then the really interesting hypothesis from a historical perspective becomes, if you had access to the best food all the time, would you eat plants? And I think the answer is no. I think that if you're walking by a bush with like small blueberries, you're probably going to eat some, mm -hmm. you know? Is it going to comprise a lot of your diet? No. And if, it's going to be very seasonal. Very seasonal, very small, probably bitter and much more chewy, right? But you're not gonna not eat the blackberry, but a lot of what we see now is cultivated. It didn't look the same. 
people have seen wild strawberries, they're like the size of my nail. Yeah, and they're surprised, they're like, what is that thing? Yeah, it doesn't even look like what you buy at the store. No, it's a completely different thing. And they certainly wouldn't eat the strawberry leaves, right? They're not gonna eat all the, they might eat the fruit, and we can talk about this as a whole other conversation about fruit and what plants are probably doing with fruit and at least my hypotheses about what fruit represents for humans. But a whole other discussion about whether fruit has any real biological value or net benefit. But I think that, yeah, we probably would have eaten some plants, but I really think that if you look at the nutritional data, you look at the nutrient availability, it's pretty clear if you can get everything you need in the most bioavailable forms and not have any of the toxins, nothing that's gonna give you a stomach ache or give you diarrhea or any of these plant things, then you're probably gonna get that. And if you look at the Inuit and other indigenous cultures, you see that. When the explorers ask them, they'll say, I mean, I think this is a quote from Stephenson, although I don't remember the exact book who was the guy that went to um, live with the Inuits. And they said, we only eat plants when there's not real food available. And they were saying, or we, we only, yeah, if there's not animals available. So that idea, that hierarchy of foods. It's so interesting. I mean, we had an interaction at dinner where there was a, a good friend of mine, conventional dietitian, right? Um, more integrative, not necessarily conventional, but but how do people respond to this? Because it was kind of curious. I was like being the outsider seeing, because I remember when I first heard this, I thought, you know, people aren't out, out there hunting. They're not getting grass fed. Like, you know, they're posting pictures of fast food without the bun. So I'm like, is this really the best thing? Um, but I realized I was being a little incongruent because I realized that like, if my brother went to a farmer's market and bought broccoli, I would never say, you didn't go out there and grow that yourself. I would have like applauded that. Right. So I was applying incongruent, you know, arguments, but long story short, it's interesting how people respond to this. Like, and, and you present it so eloquently and, and things like that. But have you found most people are generally, when they hear about that you're eating a raw, particularly now, raw meat only diet, like their responses are, it's pretty interesting. Like the, the, the variety of like kickbacks and people don't really jump to the benefits. They immediately say, what about this? What about that? What about the fiber? What the phytonutrients, the this? How have you like, been seeing the responses so far. It's pretty triggering. Yeah. I've been experimenting. I should just clarify for people that I've been experimenting with sort of a raw carnivore diet for a few weeks and I'm doing a trial looking at my inflammatory and oxidative stress markers. But the, for the majority of the time that I've been doing a carnivore diet strictly, which is about 10 and a half months at this point, I've been doing cooked. So mm -hmm. maybe that's a little bit less controversial because raw carnivore gets pretty controversial. But I am interested and we can maybe talk about the products of cooking the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and heterocyclic amines and the impact they may have on oxidative stress. So I've been experimenting with that. But yes, whether we're talking about raw carnivore or carnivore, people generally get triggered. <laughs> they think, I mean, it was funny because this happened at dinner when we were there. The first question is, how do you poop? 100% of the time, 99% of the time, funny? how do you poop? And in friends that I have who are doing carnivore diets, I was just working with a client earlier today. He's a firefighter in Los Angeles. And he said, I was at the station, I was talking to my buddies and they see what I'm eating and they say, what are you doing eating only animal products? How do you poop? They only wanna know how you poop. And so it's very triggering for people and it brings up a lot of interesting questions. I mean, to be honest with you, Mike, when I first heard about it, I thought it was crazy too. There's right? so much conditioning. I mean, yeah, you know, I'm a physician, I trained in functional medicine and within all of these paradigms, plants are felt to have unique roles. Plants are felt to have valuable compounds in them, polyphenols, fiber. So there's a lot of unlearning or at least a little bit of mental flexibility that it takes to even entertain the notion. And we can talk about this more. You and I were just talking about this before we jumped on to the recording. To even entertain the notion that perhaps our paradigm of polyphenols is not entirely correct or that our entire notion of uh, fiber doesn't really hold up to scientific scrutiny, that takes a lot of mental flexibility. And I think unfortunately, for whatever reason, food and religion get connected a lot, or food becomes a religion, and people have strong reactions, but it's always fun kind of just questioning, you know, and, and seeing what comes out of that. Because usually when people have those strong reactions, I ask, okay, well, tell me what your hesitations are. Mm -hmm. You know, talk to me about what you think you need. And they'll say, well, what about fiber? And I think that was exactly yeah, just, this. Yeah, yeah this, this, what about fiber? What about nutrients? And then uh, usually an interesting discussion ensues. And you talk about the, the clinical trials that have shown that fiber restriction actually improves GI function, which I think is mind bending for people. And they start to, I do this, like I used to have these big old salads and I would feel bloated and gassy. And then it was finally, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna try 
just meat only, right? Like last year. And I was like, I actually feel way better. But it was like my biases were pulling me towards the salad, right? Because, you know, we hear it on TV and everything like that. Eight to nine servings of vegetables or whatever, nine to 12, right? So uh, it's super interesting. Well, maybe let's drill down on the polyphenols. Um, I'll just be totally clear. I'm, I'm like a polyphenol biased person. So, I, But I, I realize that with nutrition, you have to enter this with a beginner's mind on all these topics, you know, because it, you can box yourself into a little bubble. So I'm pro polyphenol. Tell me why we should maybe rethink the whole polyphenol thing. And I was pro polyphenol in the past, you know? Um, and I think that the polyphenols are perhaps the thing most people in the space will have the most concerns about or, or where there's the most active discussion about. Sure. You know, I think that it's pretty easy for me to walk someone through the fiber studies and to show them that there are studies that show that idiopathic constipation improves when you limit fiber. And there's really no studies that show that fiber intervention improves colon cancer outcomes or recurrence or uh, the surveillance of new precancerous lesions in the colon. Uh, there's really no studies that suggest that fiber is beneficial for humans in any real way. Um, there are some epidemiology studies, but those are probably confounded by what we would call healthy user bias. In terms of interventional trials with fiber, and we need to make a real distinction between interventional and observational epidemiology, but in terms of interventional trials with fiber, there just are not real trials which show benefit in terms of cancer, in terms of constipation, in terms of many outcomes. It's just kind of a it's just kind of a specter. It's something that gets repeated over and over, but doesn't always seem to hold up. The polyphenol thing is a little bit more sticky. It's kind of a, this, this bramble patch and to weed through it, but I like what you said about beginner's mind. So if we start, if we just back up from the polyphenol argument and try to forget everything that we've been taught about them or heard about them, and just think about it this way. Polyphenols is a, is an orga is a term in organic chemistry that means multiple phenol residues. Phenol is an organic six-membered ring, so it's six carbons with a uh, aromatic structure, which means you know electrons are shared. It look you know it's a it's a hexagon with sort of these lines in it. If you look at the organic chemistry diagram, meaning there's aromatic structure and it has a it has a hydroxyl group, so it has an OH group. That is a phenol. Polyphenol is a is a class of molecules that are organic molecules that have multiple six-membered rings and aromatic structures. Now polyphenols, kind of like cholesterol. Polyphenols is a general term that doesn't always accurately describe what we're talking about. What we're really talking about when we say polyphenols are really plant compounds. But a lot of plant compounds we're talking about are not polyphenolic. Like isothiocyanates, for instance, sulforaphane, is not a polyphenol, but it's a plant compound. So if we expand the discussion to just talk about plant compounds, that is the correct term because they're not all structured that way. But that will include things like sulforaphane, uh, resveratrol is actually polyphenolic, uh, curcumin is actually polyphenolic, but some of the compounds we'll talk about are not polyphenols. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about plant compounds, let's just back up a moment and think about it kind of on first principles. Plants are rooted in the ground. They don't have really much interest in making themselves tasty, nutritious, or easily obtainable to animals at all. Most polyphenols and plant compounds are actually plant defense chemicals. They're plant defense chemicals. They're called phytoalexins. Sulforaphane is a phytoalexin. Resveratrol is a phytoalexin. Resveratrol is a molecule that plants make to defend themselves against insects and fungus. It's not a molecule that plants make to benefit an animal eating them. So we just need to remember that these are molecules that plants are making for themselves. The broader context that I try and elaborate for people is the idea that these are different operating systems. We kind of touched on that in the beginning. Plants have a way of doing things and animals have a way of doing things. And these are very different and never the twain shall meet. These are really like computer operating systems. You have Mac and you have PC and you can decide whichever one, which one is human, whatever your bias is. I think of humans as Macs and plants as PCs. That shows you where my bias is because I have a Mac. But there are different operating systems. So plants are kind of doing their thing. They're doing their biochemistry. They're using polyphenols and plant molecules for defense purposes usually. Sometimes they are pigments. Flavonoids are another part of the polyphenol family and they're often pigments. But 
people need to realize these molecules are not designed for animals by plants. This is not a symbiotic relationship. There are symbiotic relationships in nature. This is not one of them as far as we know. And I don't really think that's debatable or an opinion. That's really scientific fact as we accept it at this moment in time. This is not a lichen. You know, this is not a bacteria and a fungus working together. This is plants doing plant things and animals doing animal things. And the majority of the time, these molecules are plant defense molecules against insects, against fungus, against animals. So just at that moment, if we just pause there and think, why would we think these were good for us? And I think that the way that we approach the research to polyphenols is a little bit wrong. We have an assumed hypothesis. We have an assumed paradigm that these molecules are going to have benefit for humans. And I would argue we need to probably take the other, the other position, the complete opposite position and say, I wish that the burden of proof were on the researchers to show, hey, you prove to me this is beneficial because I don't think the plant wants it to be beneficial. And generally it's doing that to poison me and everything else eating it. So we better do a lot of research to make sure that's really beneficial because just the way it's designed is not as something that is beneficial for anything except keeping the plant alive. Sulforaphane is a great example, and I think hopefully if we talk about sulforaphane and some similar compounds, it'll illustrate this concept. So sulforaphane is a phytoalexin, which is just a word that means plant defense chemical. Now, in a mustard plant, sulforaphane does not exist. So forafane exists as a precursor molecule called glucoraphanin, mm -hmm. and there is an enzyme called myrosinase. Now, we see this pattern in a lot of plants that we encounter. The same pattern is in cassava with the precursor molecule, which is called linamarin, and the enzyme called linamarinase, and they're sort of separate, and they don't touch. They don't do this like magical chemical reaction unless something chews the plant. And this is what happens in mustard plants. Garlic. Yeah. Things like this. So mustard plants, I mean all the mustard family, which is mustard, kale, collards, ca uh, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, these are all the mustard family. Or cassava, right? The linamarin, the linamarinase, when it's chewed, those combine to form hydrocyanic acid. Frankly toxic, which is why cassava is really, really toxic for people unless you process it in the right way. Wow. The same thing happens in broccoli, kale, all these brassicate vegetables, all of these. The, the sulforaphane doesn't exist until we chew it. And to me, this is a really clear example that this is a defense compound. Sulforaphane is a very oxidatively reactive molecule. And so it takes a molecule that's more stable, glucoraphanin, it combines it with myrosinase, and then when it's chewed and these things get together, it's kind of like super glue, right? You have to combine the two glues or like some chemistry experiment, baking soda and vinegar, you get the reactant and the reactant is sulforaphane. The plant doesn't use sulforaphane in its biochemistry. It uses sulforaphane as a toxin for animals that are eating it. And it discourages animals from eating it because it's a very oxidatively reactive molecule. Oxidation reduction is often something that isn't well defined. So it's just the movement of electrons. Loss of electrons is oxidation, reduction is gain of electrons. So when I say that sulforaphane is an oxidative stressor or an oxidatively reactive molecule, it's a pro-oxidant, meaning it is going to cause other molecules to give up an electron to sulforaphane. It's going to strip electrons from other molecules, and that is basically what happens when something is an oxidative stressor. We probably heard this term, it's an oxidant, right? People talk about free radicals. Free radicals. Thing. Yeah. It's gonna create, sulforaphane creates free radicals in the human body. There's lots of research to suggest that sulforaphane will create lipid peroxides in the human body. Mm -hmm. Things like 4-HNE and acrolene, which are peroxidation products of lipids in the membrane. Now you never hear about sulforaphane doing this, but that's what it does. So when you eat sulforaphane, and we can back up a little bit and just say that, so basically what happens is if you eat raw broccoli, then the myrosinase is active, the glucoraphanin is there, you're gonna get sulforaphane, which is why people eat broccoli sprouts. Mm -hmm because they have the highest amount of glucoraphanin. Now, if we just pause right there, why would a broccoli sprout or a broccoli seed have the highest amount? Because it's very defenseless. It is, that is the, where you wanna defend it the most. If an animal eats a part of a broccoli plant, it's not gonna die. If an animal eats part of the sprout or a part of the seed, it's done. That plant is not growing. Right. If you look at these toxins or these plant chemicals, when you see a plant chemical that is highest in the seed, you think, 
That's a defense chemical. <laughs> that is a defenseless plant baby. And it is saying, please don't eat me or I will poison you. So it's just, if we just back up and we think about it, maybe plant seeds don't want to get eaten. And we can see that with lectins, we can see that with oxalates, and we see that with these plants defense chemicals. They're often highest in the seed. But we have the paradigm all wrong. That's why it's so high in the seed. That's why people eat broccoli seeds and broccoli sprouts, because they have the most of this plant molecule in them. And so if we eat them raw, you'll get myrosinase, and you'll get glucoraphin, and you'll get sulforaphane. If we cook them, then you'll denature the myrosinase. But then the problem is that if the glucoraphanin goes into your gut, there's myrosinase in the bacteria production in your gut, and you can still make sulforaphane in your gut, for better or for worse, I would argue for worse. So even if you cook the plant, you'll still make sulforaphane. So basically what we've got now on this long and arduous journey that I'm taking us on is a plant defense chemical that's stored in the plant. You eat the plant, it makes sulforaphane. Sulforaphane comes into your body, and your body immediately says, that is a pro-oxidant. I need to get rid of that. The body doesn't really circulate sulforaphane. There's nowhere in human biochemistry that we need a sulforaphane vitamin. There's no biochemical reaction in the human body that needs sulforaphane as a cofactor. Your body sees it and it says, that is toxic, and your body starts to clear it immediately. And it turns on the NRF2 or the NRF2 pathway in the liver, which is our sort of generalized pathway for creation of antioxidant molecules. So sulforaphane is a pro-oxidant and it turns on our antioxidant pathway because the body is saying, hey, this is an oxidative stress. I need to turn on the antioxidants. I need to make more glutathione to get rid of this and to protect myself from this molecule. Now, before we get rid of it completely, sulforaphane circulates in the human body and competes with iodine at the level of the thyroid and can potentially induce thyroid abnormalities. And then sulforaphane can induce membrane damage. The problem here is that because we've been looking at sulforaphane through the lens of some magical molecule that humans need or is beneficial, we do studies that are designed to show benefit and we interpret studies looking for the benefit of sulforaphane. There are studies which show that sulforaphane decreases DNA damage. But the, we're looking at them from a different lens, right? We're looking at them from the perspective that sulforaphane is beneficial. The, it's not the sulforaphane that directly decreases DNA damage. It's the glutathione that gets made because of the sulforaphane that decreases DNA damage. And the reason that's a very important point is because we don't need sulforaphane to make glutathione. The human body can make glutathione on its own and the human body can do its own management of oxidation and reduction reactions without the sulforaphane molecule. Heat stress, like a sauna, cold plunging, exercise, these all are these all are environmental hormetics, and we might segue into the, con into the concept of hormesis. But these are environmental hormetics. But what we're talking about here is a, the concept of a xenohormetic or a molecular hormetic. And I would argue this is a little bit shaky, this concept of molecular hormesis. It's not quite the same as environmental hormesis because, and this is really, really the key point, because these molecules are from a different operating system, and unless we are able to see the sum effect in the human body and not just focus on the one beneficial effect, I fear that we're being too myopic. We have blinders on. So that's what I am hoping to bring to the conversation around the plant molecules, this idea that whether we're talking about resveratrol, whether we're talking about curcumin, or in this case, sulforaphane, if we focus too much, if we are too biased and we focus too much on the fact that sulforaphane generates glutathione, and we forget that it does other negative things in the human body because it's a foreign molecule, and in fact, it's a toxin from the plant, then we lose the perspective and we say, okay, wait a minute, let's just go back to the beginning. It's a plant toxin. It's doing something in the human body that's redundant, that we don't need sulforaphane to do, that we can do by living a radical life. I like to say you can just get outside and do exercise and increase your glutathione. You can get outside and jump in a cold lake or go in a sauna. That will be an environmental hormetic, an environmental stress that leads to an adaptation. So it's a molecule that does something that's redundant and then it has back end negative effects that we're never told about. And I would argue that's a clear net negative for these molecules. So then you start to kind of think of the, the perspective like, wait a minute, why did we think polyphenols were good for us in the first place? Why do we think plant molecules were good for us in the first place? Because if you look across the molecules, if you look across resveratrol, if you look across curcumin, if you look across other plant molecules that people think of as beneficial, the same pattern is invariably there. 
there's this pattern of a few studies maybe showing a benefit in one aspect, but they're just like this little tiny, you know, this little tiny space. And they're saying there's a benefit here. But if we look at the sum amount of literature, we can always find other places in the human body where they are causing harm. And this little benefit is, I've never seen a benefit that's unique to that molecule. It's something that we can achieve in other ways in our life. So it's kind of a complex concept, but it's a redundant benefit with other collateral damaging effects. So clearly that studies ignore. That studies ignore. Or people looking at the studies don't look at or are unwilling to because they're looking at the positive side. They're looking at the positive side. And then I think that for many of these, we're just not considering the overall effect of these molecules. So that's a real diff that's a little bit different perspective on polyphenols and plant molecules. Like what is the net effect in a human? And from what I've studied, I'm just not convinced that there's a, there's a plant molecule out there that's a net positive for a human. They're, they may have a benefit in one space, and we can talk about resveratrol if we want, but like sulforaphane, it's gonna increase your glutathione because it's a pro-oxidant, but the downside of that is if you get too much, you can definitely overwhelm your body's ability to make glutathione, then it's gonna become clearly a pro-oxidant, it's clearly a toxin. And it's doing all these other negative things in the human body, and the one positive effect, you didn't even need it for in the first place. So it's clearly net negative. And, and then you say, okay, well, well, what are the other foods I can eat that don't have a net negative? Well, animal foods don't have toxins like this, right? They haven't evolved because animals can run away or bite you. Right. Gosh, that's super fascinating because I think the pro side of the polyphenols is they think that process is beautiful. Like, wow, you get this myrosinase and, and glucoraphin and then your, your microbiome can make the myrosinase as well. And it's actually a mild toxin that has a xenohormetic effect. So, so you definitely hit, you, you hear about the upside, but it does make sense. You're like, wow, broccoli sprouts, they're, they're most vulnerable, you know? And so they don't have the tools or mechanisms or the stability to evade predation or whatever. Um, wow, so this is, I, you know, I think it's important wherever anyone is on the dietary spectrum, it's, it, I think it's important to hear both sides. Because if you just hear what you wanna hear more of, because that's what I found with the internet particularly, is people just seek out more of the same. They wanna confirm their biases and hear more of the same. So I think it's great that we're having this conversation because, um, you know, I guess, on the opposite side of the spectrum, you know, the vegans argue that now we we have the technologies like B12, synthetic B12, we can get DHA from algae. So it's a beautiful time to be, be vegan because we don't need to, you know, rely upon animals for these compounds. What would you say to, to that argument? I mean, I would say that that's a vast oversimplification of the sum total of human nutrition <laughs> to think that if we can get synthetic B12 and synthetic DHA, we're getting everything in an animal. It's almost like this reductionist perspective, in my opinion. I've heard some people say that it doesn't matter what you eat. It's all about calories in, calories out. And then you can just take a multivitamin for your minerals and vitamins. And I always bristle at that. I think that is so reductionist. You really think you've got it all figured out, that you can just take a multivitamin and your calories, and that is the same as real food. That to me is just a travesty of an intellectual hypothesis or an intellectual position to take because that's clearly not the case. We know that animal foods are much more than the reductionist vitamins and minerals that are in them. And they are the structure, they are the matrix, they are the amino acids, they are the amino acid availability, they are the cofactors. And to imagine that you can substitute animal foods with B12 and DHA is just a very scary position for me. It's, this happens, I think this is an intellectual error that we make over and over as humans in our society, and this is a broader context. I think that we are smart, and because we have had some small victories in medicine and nutrition and health, I mean, we've made scanning electron microscopes and we've understood quarks, I think that we've gotten a little too prideful and we imagine that as humans, we can outsmart natural, the natural world, that we can outsmart nature. And that may sound woo-woo, but I think it's pretty damn difficult to outsmart three million years of natural history and evolution. And anytime we try to do that, I get worried. Whether it's peptides, whether it's the latest greatest drug, whether it's the latest greatest hormone or hormone combination, I think you are messing with three million years of the natural world's wisdom. You really think you're smarter than that? Just wait, just wait, just wait, you'll see. And to reduce animal foods to B12 and DHA is, that's a really, really bad idea. And as we've been talking about, all those plant foods that you're eating on a vegan diet are gonna come with tons of plant toxins. So yes, I think that we are at a time in human history when you can actually eat all plants and not get nutritional deficiencies in the first year or two because you can supplement the heck out of it.
right? right? You can get, but but I mean, the list goes on. Where's your zinc? Where's your carnitine? Where's your carnosine? Where's your choline? I mean, it's a huge list of things. How much protein are you getting? Are you actually in a net positive nitrogen balance? Like, let's check your labs. Are you getting enough iodine? Where are you getting iodine from on a vegan diet? Like. It doesn't make sense. You have to supplement with probably 27 different things. You have to think about the availability of your protein, the net nitrogen uses of your protein. And you know, people may not know this about me. I was a vegan, I was a raw vegan for about seven months, about 14 years ago. And my problem, and one thing I've heard from a lot of other people, in fact, my client said the same thing today, is that even if you're able to eat the foods and perfectly construct micronutrients, you're gonna have so much gas that nobody's gonna be around, wanna be around you in the first place. And and I don't believe that in any way, shape, or form, a synthetic diet is the same as a real foods diet. You know, like you can eat plants and take 25 supplements, but then you think, well, what's in your supplements? Yeah. And are they bioavailable in the same way? And do they have the cofactors like they do in the food? And to imagine, we've done so much in human nutrition, but to imagine that we really understand fully the way that humans eat and digest their food, I think is just, that's just pride. And that's just, that's, that's, that's a folly. Well, I agree. I mean, I think there's a lot more to food than we uh, recognize. MicroRNA, transfer yeah. RNA, like other molecules that are not quote unquote macronutrients. Yeah. Now, I think that's what you're getting from plants uh, and animals in a good or bad way that a lot of people don't think about. Um, for example, um, you know, the, there's animal studies that show like stressed out animals, for example, like pre-slaughter stress affects the transcription factors of various genes in the animal product. So I, I love how you're bringing, you know, to this whole carnivore movement, like the grass fed movement, you know, eating more organic, free range, things like that. Because uh, one of the qualms that I had seeing this thing take off is a lot of people, you know, going to the fast food, taking the bun off the burger, saying that, you know, there's really no difference between grass fed or grain fed, like it, does, it meets meat, just get what you can afford. I understand like some people, like I've been in that place financially before in my life where grass fed was, is a luxury. But the uh, the other constituents that could potentially be in lower quality foods, um, both plant and animal, right? And the Big other deal. thing about that, you hit, just to hit on one more thing, the supplements, I've been in the supplement space since 06, they're not free of iatrogenesis, right? So there is heavy metals, arsenic, lead, mercury, cadmium in supplements, even vegan proteins, for example. Yeah. Very high. Highly contaminated. Yeah. People don't think about the metals in their supplements. And I see a lot of clients with high heavy metals and we think, where are you getting this from? I saw a guy the other day with a really high tin and I think it's in his supplements. And so anyway, that's a whole other story. But you make a great point there about the, the quality of the meats and that's super important. I mean, just before we jumped on the interview, I was mentioning that I saw a study today talking about the estrogen levels in the fat yeah. of meat. Tommy Wood actually sent it to me and it was looking at the estrogen, so the estrogen, Drone, which is E1, and estradiol, 17 beta estradiol levels in the fat of animals, the fat of grain fed animals. And they were comparing the estrogen levels in American cattle, grain fed cattle versus Japanese cattle. And what they found was that there were pretty significant levels of estrogen uh, of E2, which is estradiol and E1, in the fat of American animals that are grain fed. And there were almost none of these in the Japanese animals. So it really has to do with the way that we are raising our grain-fed animals in the United States. This is a big deal, and I mean, I hear that, and I mean, it gets me where it hurts, like it hurts me right between the legs, and I'm thinking, all right, this is another reason to eat grass-fed meat, grass-fed, grass-finished. You know, I was recently talking to someone else on a podcast, and they were telling me that in grain-fed cattle, they will put a myco, they'll put like a mold toxin pellet in the ear of the animal, I think it's called xerolinone, and that pellet affects the uh, the metabolism of the animals so significantly that they can feed the animals 30% less feed or the animals will get 30% fatter on the same amount of feed because this is a natural mycoestrogen. So it's an estrogen mimetic compound from a mold and it's considered, it's, a, it's legal for them to do it. And this is another example of where these cows may be getting estrogenic molecules from if they are not grass fed. So the whole grass fed, grain fed conversation, I'm sensitive to the fact that grass fed meat is more expensive. and people sometimes want to paint me into a corner on interviews and say, well, what if somebody can't get grass-fed meat? What would they do? And I'd be like, look, I don't think these are fair questions. I think we just need to put it out there for people and let them know, and they can prioritize and do the best they can. And I think it's very clear in my mind that for environmental reasons, we definitely know that grass-fed animals have less of a carbon footprint, and we can go into the carbon footprint stuff a little bit if people want to hear about that. But sure. 
the short and the long of that is that it's been widely over, uh, overly simplified and that grass-fed animals are probably actually carbon negative because of the way they enrich the soil. But grass-fed animals are clearly better from an environmental perspective. And the grain-fed animals are getting fed grains which have mold on them, which can have mycoestrogens, which can have atrazine on them, which is an estrogen. They're given these pellets in their ear, which are estrogens. And it's very clear from that study, at least looking at that today, that we see higher levels of estrogen, much higher levels of estrogen in the fat of grain-fed animals in the US. That's not what I wanna be eating. I don't wanna be eating estrogen in the fat of my animals. As we saw before this, as I was eating my meal, I often will just eat you know, a supplemental source of fat, like suet or actual fat to go with my meat as I'm sort of doing this simplified carnivore experiment. And I want to believe that doesn't have added estrogens in that fat. I, I wanna keep my testosterone and estrogen levels healthy for a human male. So the quality of the meat is critical. And I think that if we're talking about meat, this has to be part of the conversation. I appreciate other people in the carnivore movement who are trying to say, hey, look, this is easy. You can do it. Simplify. If, if you're traveling, you can get Wendy's burger patties. And every time I see it, I just kind of shake my head and say, no, I, I don't think so. I think if people are traveling and they can't get good meat, if they can't prepare the meat before they go, then just fast. It's a good time to fast. <laughs> That's a great time to fast. Like, I just don't think, just don't, don't even eat. Like, fasting is beneficial. I'm sure you've talked a ton about that, autophagy, like just fast. Don't eat the Wendy's patties, in my opinion. I wouldn't do it. That's my personal approach too. It's a natural way to just build into fasting into your lifestyle, right? And, and so, because um, you're sitting anyway, it's not like you necessarily need a lot of extra protein, you're just sitting. I mean, unless you're a competing bodybuilder or training for some specific event and have to have your macros. Yeah, I agree 100%. The other thing, I mean, um, that I see, you know, when you drive along freeways, you see uh, feedlot cattle, they're right next to a freeway. And we, and we know that diesel fume exhaust and there's, there's various chemicals. When I was bike racing a lot, I had really high levels of cadmium and arsenic wow. in my blood because I was sucking down, you know, training six hours a day, sometimes 25 hours a week, trying to be a pro cyclist, just inhaling this exhaust, right? And so that's the other thing too. I think, you know, um, finding cattle ranchers that are out in the middle of nowhere, if you can connect with a hunter, you know, we have some hunter friends and they often don't like to eat the organs. They're going for the muscle meat so you can get a lot of free organs from your hunter friends if you befriend them which is cool. I know you're promoting nose to tail, which I think is cool because again, you know, when I see all these people on Instagram, just going to Costco, loading up on just the muscle meat, you're like, you're missing out on some organs, man. And you brought it up earlier. This is such a good point. I think we have to take a step back and a lot of what we're talking about here with the nose to tail carnivore diet seems radical to people. But in the evolutionary context of the last 2 million years, everything about what we're doing now, eating plants, eating processed foods, is incredibly radical. There is nothing radical about eating animals nose to tail from an evolutionary perspective. That is probably the most primordial thing that we could do in terms of eating animals. And we've all become separated, for better or for worse, I would argue for worse, from the process of hunting, from blood and guts, and from our animals, and from the, the respectful hunting and killing of animals. And I think that is probably the beginning of a major problem for humans. Because for us, it always makes me sad when people in the US say, I don't like liver, that's gross. I posted on my Instagram the other day that I was eating some like grass-fed animal fat and somebody said, that's disgusting. And I thought, you know, I respect that you're not used to that. I'm not trying to offend you, but think about the conditioning that's going on there. That is something that we as humans have been doing for four million years. And only within the last blink of an eye has that become weird. I mean, this I don't know what this person's ethnicity was, but I bet two to three generations ago, their ancestors were doing exactly that. You know, we think maybe three generations back for you, for me, our ancestors were killing animals by hand and eating nose to tail. It's only within the last few generations that we've had this influx of processed foods and this simplification of foods. And we've only started eating tenderloins and ribeyes and New York's, and we don't even know what suet is. I didn't even know what suet was until the last few years. Suet is the fat around the kidney, but nobody eats that. That's incredibly calorically dense and nutritious. Nobody eats the kidney anymore. We say, oh, that's gross, I couldn't eat a kidney. Mm -hmm. But from an evolutionary perspective, from a historical perspective, that's our heritage. And it just makes me sad to think that that is something that we have gotten so far away from. And there are cultures on the earth now that still do that. You know, Asian cultures, it's not strange at all to eat liver or to eat all these parts of the animal that we consider exotic and weird. And I, you know, I think that it, it just makes me sad that we see it as gross. And that to me is the beginning of a major problem because that's the key, I think. I mean, people, 
as I'm thinking about how to share this message of eating nose to tail and a carnivore diet, I'm constantly trying to think how to share the message with people in a way that's not too scientific, not too complicated and approachable. And inevitably, inevitably I get asked questions about what I eat and the way that I construct a diet. And always I think, man, nobody's going to understand the way I eat because it's so different than the way that everyone else eats. And there's, there's really no way to tell a human in 2019 about eating nose to tail without them kind of thinking that is really strange. But I would just caution people against that first reaction and ask them, like you said, the beginner's mind and say, step back. Think about what your ancestors were doing a few generations ago and hunting. If you were hunting an animal with a tribe of people, you would eat exactly this way. Mm -hmm. You would thank the spirits, thank the universe for the sacrifice of the animal. You would respectfully butcher the animal. You would bring the animal back to your tribe and you would eat the whole thing and have a dance and a fire and, and be thankful. And you would eat the bones and the bone meal and you would eat the bone marrow and you would eat the brain and you would eat the organs and the liver and the muscle meat and all the fat. And any piece of the animal you could eat, you're gonna eat it. And that, I think, is, so the idea of eating nose to tail in 2019 is, is we're, we're doing it in the best way we can. We can't always do that, but if people think that that's crazy or different, it's only because we've become so far removed from where we were. And I think the counter argument people would say is, well, we've gotten more advanced. We don't need to do that anymore. And I think that's a little bit of- You can take a pill for that. Right, that's why we take, that's why we take pills and, you know, soil and green and, yeah, these like processed Beyond Burgers. And I think that, that that's the sad part of it for me is that that's just not the same. And we can't take a pill for that. And health outcomes and people actually living and experiencing the diet this way will see that that is true. Like when people are actually able to create a nutrient rich diet, even if it has some plants in it, when they create a nutrient rich diet with less plant toxins and more animal foods and more organs, the proof is in the pudding, they feel better. I mean, you just feel different. You don't get that buzz with a pill. No. You just don't. You don't. There's magic in what we've always done. And I think it's very, it's very dangerous to lose all that and to imagine that we're just, that we are just becoming wiser and smarter and we can just discard all these things, discard hunting, discard really understanding where our food is coming from and what that food means to us and how to eat that food. That is a that is a very dangerous decision on my part, in, in my opinion. Well, I'm glad you're talking about that because I, I don't see too many other people speaking to that, at least in, in this space. So I think it's really helpful, you know, that we hear that message, especially from, you know, a physician like yourself. And, you know, one little small tip a lot of people don't realize is, you know, some of these smaller grass-fed farmers, they don't really have a demand for, say, kidneys, tongue, whatever. So if you befriend them and you get on their email list, when they slaughter, you can get a lot of that for free. Because unfortunately, sometimes that just goes to waste. They give it to dogs or whatever. So that's one thing I found with our, our barren farms locally here in the Northwest is like, you can get a lot of that. You've figured out a great way to get animal fat, you know, like the, the bovine fat. So, um, you know, most people, unless you live in Manhattan, like you could find a farm within a hundred mile radius and figure it, figure it out and a little planning, like you said. So I understand the affordability argument, but like, you know, if they're going to throw it away anyway, you can get it. So Oregon meats are cheap. Yeah. I mean... That's the other thing I would say to people, even organic grass-fed liver is $4 a pound most of the time. So that's cheaper than muscle meat. And if you start including organic grass-fed liver in your diet, I think everyone is gonna feel better. That's a great first step. The arguments around affordability, I, I wanna be sensitive to those. And I also wanna challenge people to, uh, to examine how they are prioritizing their finances and say, you know, well, what is more important than food? <laughs> your food, I. And this is one of probably the greatest paradigm shifting concepts for Western medicine of our generation. And I hope that Western medicine comes around to this concept. The idea that food is linked to disease would be paradigm shifting in Western medicine. If, if, physician, if more physicians were willing to see or learned or accepted or decided that food was connected with disease, we would have a sea change in Western medicine because the way it is now Unfortunately, just because of the way we're trained, it's not a, not a lack of intelligence or good intention of any of these physicians. It's just because of our training and the fact that nutrition is not part of our training and even fundamental functional nutrition and root cause based nutrition is not a part of our training. But 98% of the physicians that I hear of and that I work with don't think or don't have even the tools to begin to approach the ways that our food creates health and disease. They don't even know where to start. Is it a vegan diet? Is it a omnivore diet, they've never even heard of a carnivore diet until now, but you know, they, they don't even know where to start. And so just for gastroenterologists or rheumatologists 
or endocrinologist to imagine that food is intimately linked to disease, that is a paradigm shifting concept. No matter what they think the food is, we should start thinking that way and we should start doing experiments to understand how food is linked to disease. When we believe that food is linked to disease, people will prioritize food. If, if the food is the arbiter of your quality of life for the rest of your life, what is more important than that? Mm -hmm. Because anyone who's been sick will know that that health is clearly the most important thing. When you're well, that sounds like a cliche. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're well and you're able to do the things that you want to do, you know, health is the greatest wealth sounds like a cliche. When you get sick, you realize that is darn true. It's so important. Yeah, that's such a great point because you realize how much you value health. I mean, I've hurt my back before, you felt sick and you're like, dude, I would do anything, pay anything to be healthy. Yeah, you know, it, it's sad. And like you said, most specialists, you know, as you become more specialized within the medical hierarchy, uh, you kind of become more disentangled with food and, and food becomes less important than the intervention or the drug or the procedure, right? And the, the kind of the message to the patient is like, oh, it doesn't matter. Take it on an empty stomach or eat food, whatever. You know, this drug is so powerful. You hear that with chemotherapy agents or cardiovascular medicine. I mean, you were a physician's assistant, a phys physician's assistant PA um, in the cath lab. Or you said a word or cardiovascular specialty? I was, in, I was in cardiology. So before medical school, I was a PA in cardiology and I worked in the hospital and with patients in the clinic. So I was actually doing cardiology medicine in the clinic and the hospital with patients. And was diet a big part of like your practice or emphasized at all? No, or? no, almost never, almost never. And again, I worked with intelligent, well-intentioned physicians mm -hmm. who didn't have the time or the wherewithal and didn't think about diet in their own lives. And I think that one of the greatest handicaps that we have in medicine is we will only recommend something to a patient when it's a double blind, randomized placebo controlled trial. So in a cardiology clinic, they may say Mediterranean diet because there's Diet Leon and a few studies that have shown that it's beneficial. And a Mediterranean diet is probably a great intervention for a lot of people, but does anybody actually know what a Mediterranean diet is? And do any of these doctors actually know what the efficacious parts of a Mediterranean diet are? No. And, you know, one office is going to tell someone, oh, a Mediterranean diet is wheat bread and olive oil. And the next office is going to say, you eat olives and you eat a lot of, uh, like, Brussels sprouts. And the next office is going to say, oh, it's snails and omega-3. And the next, I mean, but none of the offices are going to say red meat when, in fact, in the Mediterranean, they eat a lot of red meat. So the idea of a, the Mediterranean diet is kind of a farce, in my opinion. Like, clearly there's something beneficial about eating that way. And maybe it's just the fact that they don't eat processed foods. But... That's the problem with nutrition is we don't know what the efficacious part of that intervention is. And it's up to the interpretation and the bias of the physician. If it's a plant-based physician, they're going to say, look, in the Mediterranean, they eat olives and lots of plants and olive oil. You should do that. And if it's a physician that's, you know, of a different persuasion, they're going to do that. So it was only in a very brief thing. And then they'd say, oh, we're going to have the dietitian come in and talk to you. And dietitians are great, but dietitians come from certain schools of thought. And... If a dietitian is from a plant-based school of thought, they're going to come in and talk to people about plants. And in my opinion, that's not the answer for cardiovascular disease or other autoimmune disease in any way, shape, or form. Oh, so fascinating. Um, speaking of like meal timing and some of the specifics, you're doing two meals a day mm -hmm. right now. Um, do you think that's pretty ideal for most people? I mean, everyone's getting different successes with various meal timing strategies and patterns, right? But how do you decide on two meals a day? It, it kind of happens organically for me and a lot of other people on carnivore diets because the, when you're eating animals nose to tail, it's quite satiating. Some people on carnivore diets do one meal a day, which is sometimes termed OMAD, kind of a cool acronym. I guess I have two MAD. But um, for me, what I discovered was that I could not get enough calories from one meal a day, and I was so full that I generally got hungry about four to six hours later and that made sense. And then after that, I really wasn't hungry for the rest of the day. So if all things are circulating in the orbits properly and I'm creating a, and my day is going well and I don't have anything crazy going on, I'll try to eat within about a six hour window and I'll eat in the morning and then I'll eat like early afternoon and then I will generally try and fast for the rest of the day. We were actually talking, you pointed out a study to me, you actually posted this on your Instagram the other day about the meal timing of time-restricted eating being important. And I believe it was a study in diabetics. And the earlier in the day that they had the time-restricted eating window, they had improved glycemic control. I'm not diabetic, but I generally find that if I eat later in the day, my sleep is worse and whatnot. So I like that, that 
I like a time restricted eating window. I think it makes sense. I don't think there's any downside to that. And I like doing two meals. They're quite satiating. And the six hour window in the beginning of the day works for me. But yeah, I think that those are lots of in in interesting levers people can pull and kind of experiment with. So if you're surfing or doing a lot, because you're, you're pretty active, right? We went wakeboarding and wake skating on a Sunday, right? So if you're doing a lot of activity, will you add just more calories or more meals or? Probably, probably a little more calories, but it, I just go by how I feel. That's good. I don't even count calories right now. Some of my friends have been saying that I should weigh my food just so I can tell people how much I eat. So maybe I'll start doing that. I generally know how much meat I'm eating right now, but I don't have a good sense of how much fat I'm eating. I can ballpark the fat, but everyone is saying, oh, you should weigh the fat so you know how much fat you're eating. Because I'm trying to do more fat and less protein right now. I've been kind of in this phase. Previously, when I started a carnivore diet, I was doing a lot of protein. And this gets into some of the granular aspects of sure. carnivore diets and meat-based diets. And a lot of people in the carnivore world like to just eat ribeye three meals a day or two meals a day, and they'll eat pounds and pounds of ribeyes. And I have a lot of concerns about that. I have concerns about that from a nose to tail perspective, that it's not gonna be sustainable in terms of nutrients. There are all of these complementary nutrients in liver uh, that are complementary to muscle meat and other parts of the animal. We know that, or I should say, there's pretty strong nutritional evidence that the muscle meat of an animal is not nutritionally complete. Um, and I think that eating animal nose to tail makes sense evolutionarily and is more nutritionally robust. And also, I think that eating a lot of protein, we were talking about this before the interview. This is one of these things where you always have these great conversations before you get on and you try and recapitulate them in front of the cameras. We know that there's clearly a sweet spot for protein for humans, and how big or small that is is up for debate, and it's probably individual per human. On the low end of protein, what you worry about is uh, osteopenia, osteoporosis, loss of bone density, sarcopenia, loss of lean muscle mass when you get too little protein. On the high end, on the extreme high end, you get rabbit starvation, which is when your human biochemistry basically breaks down because you don't run on protein. In a grossly oversimplified way of stating it, humans don't run on protein. We run on fat or carbohydrate. We're like a car, diesel or gas. The crazy thing about humans is we can run on either. And generally we use protein as building blocks. And if we want to, we can go through this kind of clunky, difficult molecular process to turn protein into glucose called gluconeogenesis. And we can use that for energy, but we don't really use amino acids in human metabolism for energy. So if we're trying to stuff, a whole bunch of protein into the engine, it just doesn't work real well. It's kind of starvation. So high protein, low carbohydrate, low fat is essentially starvation, which is what we think of as rabbit starvation. So if we go too high on protein, we know we can get to this biochemical state called rabbit starvation. So the key is sort of understanding, is there a sweet spot? What is the best range of protein for performance, muscle maintenance, and longevity? And those may be different targets or maybe they're all the same target. What I noticed for myself and many of the people I work with who are doing carnivore diets is that on two to three pounds of meat a day, their fasting glucose was rising. It was 95, 103. I never had quite that high. I think I had some like low 90s or mid 90s. And I think what's going on is the gluconeogenesis phenomenon that if that basically your body is saying, hey, if you're only gonna give me protein and you're not gonna give me any carbohydrates because you're eating a carnivore diet, then I'm gonna make glucose out of this and it's gonna be a little higher. And if we look at the population studies, there's a big study out of Korea, and again, this is epidemiology, but it's pretty clear data that a fasting glucose of about 70 to 80 is kind of the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Above 80, maybe not so good for longevity. So I got worried and I thought, you know, I'm just not convinced. I have concerns that a fasting glucose of 93, 94, 103, maybe that's, maybe that's my body saying, hey, that's too much protein. You'll also see the BUN rise. So the blood urea or nitrogen in the body will rise on high protein. And some have argued and said, oh, that's just, a, that's just a function of too much protein or a lot of protein. It's probably not harmful. But then I thought, well, maybe it shouldn't be there that way either. So we're, we're not really sure. Um, this gets into the realm of like the astronauts in the carnivore world. We're all sort of trying to understand, well, if we're only getting animals, like what proportions of different things should we eat? And is there an ideal way to do it? And I, I think there is. And I think that what, what I've found for myself and for others is that there's a pretty large sweet spot of protein, maybe 0.6 grams per pound of lean body weight to about one or 1.1 gram per pound of lean body weight in which 
you don't get a whole lot of glucose changes and you don't lose lean muscle mass. But once you go above one or 1 1.1 gram per pound of lean body weight, I think you'll start to see that glucose creep up. And anyway, it's just this idea of trying to refine the proportions and perhaps people will think it's too esoteric or too complicated and they'll say, just let me eat a ribeye. And I think, well, if you're doing this for your health, it's worthwhile thinking about how to do it in the most intentional and healthful way. Uh, so this is that's what I think of in terms of protein and fat. So I'm trying to eat less protein, more fat right now, in addition to organs that I eat and egg yolks, things like that. So do you recommend people test first thing in the morning or post prandial? Both. Or, okay. Both. I think that if we're really going to get geeky and granular, which is interesting and valuable and pretty easy to do, I would do an AM glucose, I would do a one hour post prandial and look for an excursion. And if people really had, an excursion would be how much the glucose will rise postprandially. And anything above 20 or 30 is probably too much in a, for, for a postprandial glucose excursion. What we know is that the, the median amplitude glucose excursions or the mages are probably worse than the actual, the, the actual overall level of glucose. So in terms of glycosylation or glycation of proteins in the human body, prediabetes, diabetic phenotypes, these gl postprandial glucose excursions are very damaging and often missed if we're only checking AM fasting glucose. Mm -hmm. So if people have a keto mojo or one of these things and they're checking their ketones, I'd say, yeah, check your glucose as well. Check your glucose an hour, 45 minutes after you eat, check it before you eat, check it first thing in the morning, or get a continuous glucose monitor and look. Generally, on a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor, on a carnivore diet, it's pretty flat. You don't get a lot of postprandial glucose excursions, but people are eating mixed diets and you see a big glucose excursion, a big rise, and that's probably not a good thing for humans. Sure. So the swings are more problematic than the average being a little probably, pushed yeah. up. Yeah. And if people are just checking AM fasting glucose, they're going to miss the swings. Gosh. Yeah, that glycemic variability, there's some, a lot of talk yep. about that in, in the literature too. That's exactly what it is. The excursions. Uh, super fascinating. I mean, it's curious that you're talking about this because I think some people feel like, oh, well, maybe carnivores should adhere to like new laboratory standards, right? That maybe the the cut points for a carnivore for glucose or whatever are going to be different. And I don't. And you're saying that's. Probably I'm not convinced. Not, yeah. I'm not convinced. I think that that's a very convenient argument for carnivores, and I'm just thinking, no, I don't think so because I, I haven't lost lean muscle mass, so I'm 170 pounds. I'm 5'10", and I probably have 155 pounds of lean body weight. And I'm eating about 120 grams of protein a day now, and I'm not losing lean body mass. I'm not a bodybuilder, and I think if people are watching this and they are bodybuilders, we have to accept the fact that bodybuilding is a little bit of an unnatural or a special condition, right? For most people, they, they want to maintain lean muscle mass. They don't want to lose lean muscle mass. And at the level of protein that I'm at, which is probably about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 gram per pound of lean body weight, I'm not losing lean body mass. And you see the glucose come down. It's very clear my fasting glucose has gone down. I just had to check the other day, it was 82, you know? So it's, it's, it's down and the A1C is down and the fructosamine is down. Uh, many of these measures are lower when I'm eating less protein. So, and I think that, that that's something that I think would be so interesting to talk about. This whole realm of like, I think that we need in Western medicine ketogenic physicians, whether they're ketogenic carnivore physicians or ketogenic omnivore physicians. There are some lab values that change, right? We can talk about LDL and some things look different on ketogenic diets, but for the most part, things should be in the range in my opinion. And if they are out of the range, we need to prove that that is really the case. I think it's too convenient to say, oh, these are new lab values. We don't even know what's there because I mean, look, my BUN was high and then I, cut back on the meat and now my BUN is within range. Mm. So well, that normalized once I, maybe I think I was eating too much protein. My glucose was trending a little high. Now it's back in the range. Okay, okay, so that's another thing. Like the rest of the labs that I do generally are within the range, whether it's a comprehensive metabolic panel, you know, liver enzymes, GGT, gamma glutamyl transferase, they're all within the range. So when I look at my labs and my clients who are not sick labs, they're generally within the range. So if people are on a carnivore diet or a ketogenic diet and they're getting hugely abnormal lab values, I would say, yeah, there's probably still something going on there. A little red flag to yeah. investigate further. Yeah. yeah. Now the cholesterol is a whole different piece. Sure. And I think that that has to do with ketosis and the fact that if you are in ketosis, generally what we see more often than not is the LDL rise. Now, 
In the absence of disordered metabolism, in the absence of metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance, I don't think there's really any evidence that an elevated LDL is bad for humans. And that is an incredibly controversial statement. I've had a lot of conversations with Dave Feldman, Igor Cummins, and Dave Diamond. I did a podcast with uh, Dave on my podcast. And I think that there's some really great epidemiologic evidence and there's some really great interventional evidence to suggest that an elevated LDL with a high or moderately high HDL and low triglycerides is not the same physiologically as a high LDL with a low HDL and high triglycerides, the latter triad being more of an insulin resistant triad. So what I'm saying here is that a high LDL in the setting of insulin sensitivity is probably not the same thing as a high LDL in the setting of insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. And often, as we'll, we'll see in medicine, what we're looking at is the effect of insulin resistance rather than the other, rather than the other marker, right? So TMAO is, an, is a good example of this, but I think what we're seeing over and over within Western medicine and chronic disease is insulin resistance, insulin resistance, insulin resistance. And insulin resistance can look like low HDL, high triglycerides, high LDL, but it can also look like high TMAO. We can talk about that. And it can also look like other things. And it, we have to be careful that we're not looking at reverse causality here, that what we're, we're probably what we're really seeing as dangerous is insulin resistance rather than these other phenomena, right? So we need to know, like, is the LDL actually really toxic to the endothelium, the blood vessels? I think it's pretty hard to make that argument. And that probably what we're seeing with the disordered lipid panel is insulin resistance, and that is probably the main issue that we need to be going after. So if people are on ketogenic diets, if people are on carnivore diets, we will see the LDL rise more often than not. When I see that in people who have a high HDL and low triglycerides, and by that I mean at least 50 on the HDL, less than 100 or less than 90 on the triglycerides, I don't get worried because I'm also going to check HSCRP. I'm also gonna check a fasting insulin. I'm also gonna check a fasting glucose. I'm gonna get an A1C, I'm gonna get a fructosamine, and I'm gonna get other inflammatory markers and kind of triangulate and create a picture of insulin sensitivity. But I think that insulin sensitivity is probably the main, the main thing we need to figure out, and I don't get worried about elevated LDL on these diets. As Dave says, when you're on a fat-based metabolism, when you're using fat as fuel, when you're making ketones, your body also makes more cholesterol. And that's just part of the process. We know that ketones and cholesterol share a common pathway in the liver. It's called the mevalonate pathway. And so when you're making ketones, you're gonna make more cholesterol. It doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. It's part of human physiology. But as I'm suggesting, we're never taught about that in medical school. Physicians are not taught this is what a ketogenic person looks like. And so, so many times people come to me as clients and they say, my doctor's freaking out. I'm saying, that's normal ketogenic physiology. They've never seen anyone in ketosis. Almost 100% of people go to their doctors with LDLs above 200 and they get told they have familial hypercholesterolemia, which is not the case more, usually it's not the case at all. They just have a ketogenic diet and the doctors have never seen it. So there's a couple of things like that, but in general, the labs are pretty copacetic, even to the normal eye. It's tough. I mean, because people are trained to look at one biomarker, not patterns. Yeah. And that's the thing. So you need to look at context and like pattern recognition and, and look at, because you do hear, oh, my glucose is higher. My hemoglobin in one is normal. So therefore I'm good, right? It's not the pattern of this so-called insulin resistance phenomena, that's liver great, enzymes, yeah. LDL, and then waist to hip ratio. I mean, there's a lot of things. And I think medicine is so fast nowadays. The office visits are so short and everything like that. So I think it's important that people listen to this and, and infer for themselves or learn how to read labs. It's not that complicated. You don't need to go to medical school. I mean, no offense to medical little, school. I'm not belittling that, right? But I mean, there are certain patterns that you can kind of look at and say, well, look, if my triglycerides are low, HDL yeah. is high, LDL is probably not a problem, right? And it's like- Probably not. Yeah. Yeah, and there are ways to, you know, assure yourself of that that are better and less, you know, accurate, you know, sure. coronary artery calcium scoring, carotid intimal medial thickness is of maybe, you know, marginal value. But yeah, I mean, generally people feel good, but you're right, it's all about patterns. And so when I see someone, I wanna know everything. I wanna know thyroid, I wanna know hormones, I wanna know inflammatory markers, I wanna know insulin resistance, I wanna know lipids, and I triangulate. And like you're saying, I love what you said, it's not just about one lab. And I think that as physicians, we're not trained to see patterns mm -hmm. because it's a balkanized system. We're trained to say, the lipids are for the cardiologist. The, the hormones and the thyroid is for the endocrinologist. The, the testosterone is for the urologist. And the CBC is for the family practice doc. And you only have to look at your labs. When in fact, 
when you put it all together, that's when it starts to make sense because they're all connected. They're all connected, they have to be. And so if people really wanna understand how to look at their labs, they have to get everything. And people will always send me on Instagram, hey, look at my lipid panel. And I'm like, look, I'm not looking at your lipid panel, but I can't interpret your lipid panel In by itself. Of, yeah. yeah, what's your testosterone? You know, is your prolactin high? What's your ferritin? What's your iron storage? Tell me your thyroid. And they just, they just wanna, and I think that's totally true. It's exactly what you're saying is, they might go to their family doctor and say, hey, can I get my, my cholesterol checked? And they'll just get a regular cholesterol panel. And it won't be NMR, it won't have particle counts, it won't have particle size. Almost no one ever gets a fasting insulin or an HSCRP or a TNF alpha or any, like, so I, I agree with you completely. I think we need to totally revamp the way we look at lab work in the, in the US and as functional medicine doctors. And generally functional medicine doctors will look at patterns, but to just send me a lipid panel, I'm like, look, that means nothing. almost nothing. I mean, I can say like, it doesn't look bad, but there's 25 other things I wanna see. Is, is that cost cutting that they're trying to just like reduce expenditures? So my mom was like, hey, I wanna get a comprehensive lab you know, panel and my wife's a chiropractor, so we go through LabCorp and have this complete panel. It's CBC differential, the whole thing, iron, ferritin, thyroid, et cetera. Um, and she, I was like slow getting back to her on that because I have to like fill out a requisition and do all that. So she just went to Kaiser. Long story short, she got, it was just glucose, no hemoglobin A1C, no triglyceride, just LDL, cholesterol, and HDL, and I think one other, I think total iron, but not TIBC or ferritin. So it was like, I'm like, I'm like, wait, mom, what this, there's gotta be more to the story. She's like, no, that was it. I'm like, really? I'm like, well, what did you say? She said, I went to my family doctor I've seen for however many years, and I told her I want a comprehensive blood work. Comprehensive. That was com and I'm like, there must be some cost cutting phenomena going on where they're trying to do the bare minimum to cover their butts. Kaiser's a special situation, right? Because it's one of these like managed care networks. And in that situation, yes, I think they are cost cutting because if you order a bunch of labs, Kaiser has to pay for it. So that's a bad situation for the patient because generally speaking, labs are a very good investment. You know, that information is very valuable. And even if you do it once a year, it costs Kaiser a couple hundred dollars more or even a thousand dollars more, I would argue, they probably haven't done the studies in terms of long-term outcomes, but you can really change somebody's outcome with labs. They're so valuable, I believe. And they're very interesting. And we're not just doing them for academic reasons. But yeah, I think it's a cost-saving thing. When a patient goes to their physician and they have private insurance and the physician won't order, I, I, I kind of scratch my head. I'm like, who, like the only, like the insurance is gonna pay more. Mm -hmm. Like does a physician really think that we shouldn't burden the insurance company? In that case, it's just a judgment and I think that, that I would disagree with that, that physician's judgment. Like, I absolutely think those labs are worth it. Like, get as many labs as you can, get everything. I mean, there's only so, I mean, there's only so many labs you can possibly do, but they're all valuable. When I do blood work on my patient, it's probably 150 things. Yeah. I mean, it's, and the labs that I use are not astronomically priced for people, and they're all valuable. I mean, I'm gonna do metal, I'm gonna do heavy metals, I'm gonna do micronutrients, I'm gonna do, I mean, I just, I wanna know as much as I can, and then it kind of completes the picture. You start to see it come together, and you're like, well, oh yeah, well maybe, maybe that's high because you have a lot of lead or arsenic or mercury or cadmium and that's gonna change your inflammatory markers. Otherwise, you get an HSCRP on someone, why is that high? Mm -hmm. You know, why is, this, why is your thyroid messed up? Well, is it because you have an iodine deficiency or a selenium deficiency? Like, how do physicians put this together? And I think that there's a little bit of the ostrich syndrome, like a head in the sand. Mm -hmm. They would often say this to me in medical school, don't test it if you don't know what to do with it. And so I think it's like, if you test it, you have to deal with it. And to me, that's like, great, let's test it. Let's yeah, deal let's with it. it out, yeah. yeah, but a lot of times in the hospital, you don't wanna know. You're just like, I, I don't know. Don't check histoproponin. Yeah, what well, I've been taught by other physician friends of mine over the years is like, how is that gonna change treatment? If it doesn't change treatment, why do I wanna test that's it? That's a very good metric. So, so I, I'm like, I, can, I understand that, but it's like more, to me, more data is better. And as someone who cares about my health and has been sick before, I like to accumulate serial data so that I realize like, if something feels off, then I can go back and see pattern recognition. You know, and I think it's important for people to do that. And I would argue that in the case of what we're talking about, these, these labs will change management because we are trying to understand the underlying cause of inflammation or abnormal thyroid or whatever, anemia. Like that's gonna change management. Like understanding the root cause of an illness will change management, absolutely. And I think for a lot of physicians, it's not even in their wheelhouse to think of, unfortunately, because of the way we're trained, it's not even in their wheelhouse to think of the root cause of an illness. They're thinking, I'm gonna give you the same medication no matter what, 
And, and to me, it's like, oh, there's the problem, right? Because I want to know the root cause. That's going to change my management. They're going to give you levothyroxine no matter what. But I, I care about why your thyroid is abnormal because I can maybe, if you're selenium deficient, I'm just going to give you selenium. And that's, that's absolutely going to change my management. But I think that the problem that's going on now, and again, it's, by, it's not really the fault of the physicians. Most of the time, they're well-intentioned and intelligent. It's the system and the way we're taught we're not even thinking about the root cause. We're just thinking about the medication. And if you're always gonna give the same medication, the medication is based on the problem, not the cause. But I'm trying to find the cause. So you really, yeah, I mean, uncover what's going on. It's, yeah. The hypothyroidism thing is, is amazing. And how many people are on medication, they're really concerned about, well, I heard if you fast, or I heard if you do keto or carnivore, it affects the thyroid and everything like that. So it's, it's kind of, have you, Notice that when people do carnivore or keto that you reduce the levothyroxine, for example, or maybe it's a micronized T3, T4 combo, whatever, they become more sensitive hormonally. Have you seen it? Definitely, definitely. And the thyroid is unique. Um, generally in the thyroid, we're looking at a bunch of different labs. We don't have to get too granular, but we got TSH, we've got T4, we got T3, we got free T4, free T3, we got antibodies. I think on ketogenic diets and ketogenic carnivore diets, which would be a high fat carnivore diet, you absolutely get de decreased uh, T3 because of increased tissue sensitivity and a lot of times people can reduce their uh, combination thyroids or levothyroxine which is a T4 preparation and I've seen repeatedly people's antibody levels come down mm -hmm. which is one of the things that I think is so cool about a carnivore diet is that we're starting to approach these roots of autoimmunity and the hypothesis then becomes our plant toxins, our plant lectins, our plant oxalates triggering autoimmunity for people which is one of the coolest things about you know, a carnivore diet as a type of elimination diet saying, where is the, you know, where is the autoimmunity coming from? Well, maybe it's coming from plants. But on a carnivore diet, on a ketogenic diet, yes, we do see people more sensitive to thyroid generally. If their general practitioner is just looking at TSH, they probably won't see any change at all. But if they're looking at T4 and T3, we do see a decrease in T3. But without a decrease in T TSH, without a decrease in basal metabolic rate, the really most uh, consistent hypothesis is that it's tissue sensitivity to T3 changing and we're more sensitive because people's basal metabolic rates are not changing. They're not having symptoms of hypothyroid. TSH isn't changing. T4 is still within range. It's just way they're more sensitive. And you see that because you can usually reduce right. doses or when the antibodies come down, then you know you're really making progress because it's cool to see, man, the body is, Autoimmunity is calming down. That's the coolest thing. That's pretty amazing. And, and so from a root cause resolution standpoint, do you think that's the absence of the antinutrients in the plants that is taking the burden off the immune system? Yes. Yeah, or lectins. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many things can trigger autoimmunity, right? Could be these phytoalexins. Could be lectins, which are carbohydrate binding proteins, which can trigger the immune system. Could be oxalates. There are lots of plant toxins even outside of plant chemicals that are, you know, phytoalexins, you know, these lectins and oxalates as well. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Uh, there's this acylhydrocarbon receptor. Have you, uh, it's a kind of an anti-inflammatory reflex axis that um, vitamin A and vitamin D kind of latch onto, and it creates this anti-inflammatory signaling pathway. Mm -hmm. and, and people have been promoting, see, this is why you need carrots, beta carotene, carotenoids to kind of stimulate this. Have you dove into that a, a lot? In well, I mean, it, if vitamin A is going to signal it, you're going to get lots of preformed vitamin A in the liver. And, I mean, animal foods are clearly the best source of vitamin A. Many people have trouble converting beta carotene into vitamin A with these polymorphisms. We could talk to Ben Lynch all day yeah, about yeah. BCMO and things like that. But yeah, I, I don't, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me that they would say you need carotenoids when you can get preformed vitamin A in animal foods. So uh, it doesn't really hold a lot of weight for me. People talk about flavonoids, but we didn't even touch on this, that most flavonoids actually have estrogenic activity. So there's whole papers devoted to the fact that all this whole chemical, comp this chemical family of flavonoids generally stimulate the estrogen receptor, which is probably not a good thing for men or women. Resveratrol stimulates the estrogen receptor, not a good thing, we're never told about that. So, yeah, but is that the main argument? They, they want you to get carotenoids to, to, signal, to stimulate the acyl hydrocarbon? Because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because vitamin A is already preformed in animal foods. It's a much better source. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the vantage point of these, some of these papers, right, are kind of phytonutrient bent or plant-based kind right. of thing. So, yeah, I was just curious. That was, there's just one thing. Um, Again, it's the perspective, right? It's like the, and I have a bias too, but we all have this bias, right? If they're saying, look, this is a really great thing about plants, and I'm saying, I don't think so. 
Well, it's cool. I mean, I, I'm glad that you're opening up my eyes and other people's eyes to be a little bit more aware of this and, and understand where our biases are. And then, you know, again, approach this with a beginner's mind to, and to not be so, what about the fiber? What about the fiber? What about this? It's like, what about glycolytic work? Yeah, how are you going to make carbohydrates if you do, you know, in your body when you do jujitsu or whatever? And so, anyway, I know you're going to talk a lot about this in the book that's coming out in September. Yep. Probably November. We'll see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then will that have recipes and things? Because one thing that I think I can hear a lot of people asking is like, how do I rotate some of my organ meats? So I do like kidney one day, liver one day, tongue the other day. Like, do you have, I'm sure this is, uh, there's no clinical randomized placebo controlled trials, right? But maybe intuition do you follow or? Yeah, I mean, definitely. So the book is called The Carnivore Code. And the subtitle is Unlocking the Secrets to Optimal Health by Returning to Our Ancestral Diet. We're thinking about covers and stuff now. And we are going to have a cookbook as well. So there's going to be a carnivore code cookbook and in the book itself there's going to be meal plans and recipes for people but in terms of organ rotation i think generally if you're eating any organs you're in the 99th percentile in terms of nutrient availability and nutrient quality so you can just experiment with whatever you want i think liver a few times a week is great if you want to eat kidney if you want to eat heart sure like just just eat some organs and Trying to imagine what our ancestors would have done, both in terms of protein to fat ratios, and uh, you know, in the book I talk about eating nose to tail. I talk about needing to get at least some omega three. I think it's questionable, you know, how much omega three. Um, we can get it from fish. We can get it from grass fed animal meat. We need to get some iodine, which is generally present in muscle meat and egg yolks or or fish. We need to get some calcium. I think we would have eaten bones of small animals. A lot of carnivores leave out calcium. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll create some meal plans for people to rotate the organs. And I think that it's you know, probably difficult to overeat the organs. Liver's pretty well tolerated. If people worry about vitamin A, I don't think they need to, need to be worried about vitamin A. In toxicity. Liver. No, I don't think it's a real thing, actually. I think that the toxicity with vitamin A is only in the supplements. Again, going back to supplements and the idea that we can't be reductionist. I'm not familiar with any case reports of vitamin A toxicity from actual liver consumption. People are gonna say, what about polar bears? And I think there's a lot of concern that that was actually due to cadmium toxicity in the polar bear liver rather than vitamin A. But I've never heard of a case report of overconsumption of beef or lamb liver uh, for vitamin A toxicity. It's only been with ingestion of vitamin A palmitate and supplements. And there's actual studies in uh, pig models that vitamin A in food form is processed differently than a supplement. Imagine that. We can't be reductionists. So I don't think people need to worry about vitamin A toxicity with liver, nor do I think that many people would eat enough liver to even approach that on a daily basis, yeah. honestly. Self-limiting and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the questions I ask pretty much every guest on the show is if they were stranded on a desert island, what nutrient herb botanical or whole food substance would they, um, you know, could they not live without? But one of the questions I want to pose to you is like, out of to reduction, to be a little bit reductionist, like what's, what's one of the nutrients that gets you most excited about in animal compounds? Uh, is it carnosine, carnitine, creatine, whatever? <laughs> like what is there, if there's one thing that like you secretly have like a little research file on, uh, what would it be? Oh man, good question. I think about all of it. There's so many little pieces of it that I think about. I think that um, choline is pretty wild. Mm. I'd probably be choline. You know, choline is, this thing that's in liver and egg yolks and muscle meat, it's maligned because it can turn into TMAO, but it's a precursor for phosphatidylcholine, which is what we need to make membranes in our cells. It's a precursor for acetylcholine. And it's, you know, choline is parlayed into supplements, whether it's citicoline or other forms of choline and supplements uh, that, that are used for sort of cognitive enhancement. I think it's pretty clear that humans do well when they have a lot of choline. The other one is riboflavin. So riboflavin is one of the B vitamins that doesn't get as much sort of spotlight as folate, but there's been some pretty incredible research recently, or at least people highlighting the research, that a lot of people are probably not getting enough riboflavin, and that's probably behind the differential activation of different MTHFR polymorphisms. I, I am MTHFR677 homozygous for the polymorphism, so I have C to T, so I am, I am homozygous for the worst MTHFR polymorphism, meaning that my methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme works at about 20 to 30 percent. You know, we'd have to check with Ben Lynch, who we got to hang out with this weekend uh, on that, but from what I've heard Ben say, it's about 25 to 30 percent, so my enzyme is pretty impaired. But there's really been some interesting research recently to show that if I have adequate riboflavin, and that is probably three to five milligrams of riboflavin per day, 
that that is the crux that makes my MTHFR enzyme work well or not well. And so I was previously taking methylfolate and following my homocysteine and I would see that when I took methylfolate I could lower my homocysteine from 10 or 11 to 6 or 7. And I stopped taking methylfolate and I've been eating liver for riboflavin and muscle meat on a carnivore diet and I recently just checked my labs. I haven't had methylfolate in five months and my homocysteine is 7. So that's really, and I'm not taking any supplements right now. I mean, I'm taking electrolytes, but I'm not taking any folate. I'm just eating animal foods and my homocysteine is seven. So I think that's a real testament to the fact that perhaps that's actually what's going on, that we need to get adequate riboflavin. And I love constructing a diet from these first principles and thinking, all right, if I want to get adequate vitamin A, if I want to get adequate riboflavin, if I want to get adequate pyridoxine and B6, what do I have to eat? And the simplest thing that falls out of that for me, I'm biased, but the simplest thing that falls out of that for me time and time again is animal foods nose to tail. If you eat muscle meat and organs and fat, you'll basically get everything, like every single thing. And, and you'll get adequate riboflavin, but if you just eat the muscle meat, you're not gonna get enough riboflavin. You're not gonna get enough copper. But when you add the liver and the organs and some fat and egg yolks and some source of calcium, like it all falls out. It's like, well, isn't that convenient? You mean eating an animal nose to tail can give me everything? I oh, that's cool. So it's interesting to see the physiology play out with my homocysteine, but probably choline and riboflavin. I think that if people are thinking about their diets, they should think, where am I getting choline from? And where am I getting riboflavin from? And generally, riboflavin is poorly found in plants. And again, that's another way to kind of reconstruct this diet and think, where are you going to get your riboflavin from in plants? Good luck. Right. Or even 5-MTHF at that dose, right? L-methylfolate? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, this is something that I've, I would love to talk to Ben more about. The, the source of folate in foods is variable. I don't think there's any great research about which foods have dihydrofolate, which foods have methylfolate. Um, and methylfolate would be the type of folate that is made by MTHFR. So you take 5,10-methylene tetrahydrofolate, you put it through the enzyme, which is methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, and it becomes methylfolate. And I know that there are some foods that have methylfolate, but I don't think anybody actually knows which foods have methylfolate, which foods have dihydrofolate, which is much further up the folate continuum. As Ben has noted, there's no such thing as folic acid in our food chain. It's probably a very dangerous molecule and it's synthetic. But yeah, liver and egg yolks have a moderate amount of folate, but if you actually do the math, I'm probably getting something close to the RDA of folate, and it's mostly probably dihydrofolate. So all of it has to go through my MTHFR enzyme. I'm probably getting 400 micrograms of folate or 300 on most days, and I eat a lot of liver and a lot of egg yolks, it's hard to get enough folate from anything in your diet. If you want to get folate from kale, you're going to eat two pounds of kale. Good luck. And that's going to be a horrible disaster in terms of so many things, whether it's goitrogens or thallium contamination with kale, whatever. So I, lo I think about that. That's just so interesting to construct it and say, like, well, where would I get that in plants? Oh, How wait. How much would you have to eat? How much would you have to eat? And you couldn't even eat enough plants to do it. You know, and then you can just get it all from an animal. It's way more easy. It just makes so much more sense evolutionarily when you kind of take it on first principles. But yeah, there's probably some folate in my foods, but I think it's so interesting that by eating foods that are high in riboflavin, namely liver, that my MTHFR is probably working more. Interesting. Actively, yeah. I got to dive more into that. I mean, it's cool that you're mentioning nutrients. A lot of people, uh, you know, when I asked this question after 250 some odd uh, interviews in person that, that, that jumped to curcumin or phytonutrients. Well, you know, like that. So it was pretty <laughs> awesome to have the carnivore spin on it. Um, and I do want to thank Ken Berry and Christina Rice for linking us up because Ken texted me like in May. He's like, you got to link up with Paul. So, so that's why we're here. Thanks, um, Ken. So one of the final questions, you know, I like to ask people kind of their, their top elevator pitch in, in terms of like a health tip, right? What would you tell new residents or someone that's entering medicine for the first time or a politician about how to view this, like you said, first principles, looking at diet through that lens? I think you just, you have to imagine what does a human need to function optimally? Be an engineer, be a human mechanic. You are a mechanic. You are popping the hood on the human organism and saying, what are all the fluids that go in the human? What does a human need to function optimally? What minerals, what vitamins? Where are they most bioavailable? Where do you get them? And then where are the toxins we're going to encounter as humans? And if I'm not even going to say carnivore diet in that pitch. I'm going to say, you do that, you do that thought experiment and you tell me what you come up with. And I think, I think it's going to be a carnivore diet or it's going to be a, a carnivore adjacent or a carnivore-ish diet because if you look at it like, Th th those are the principles, right? And I mean, those are pretty basic principles. We're not even talking carnivore now. We're just talking what are the vitamins and minerals that, that humans need to function optimally. And the, once we accept the pretty radical notion that there are toxins in the environment, you know, 
where are those toxins and how do you avoid them? That would be the thing. So get everything you need and none of the toxins and I'll leave you guys to construct the perfect diet around that and see what you come up with. And I'd be curious, you know, if people want to come up with something else or think there's something that's more evolutionarily consistent then I'm open to that. I try to keep a beginner's mind too, you know, as I'm also learning about this stuff. But I think that what falls out of that more often than not is a nose to tail carnivore diet. Right. Paul Saladino, thanks so much for coming on the show. Have thanks for having me. Yeah. So I know you you have a podcast, you're big on YouTube, right? Um, Instagram's I think a big channel for you as well. Yeah. We'll put links below, but if someone's listening while they're driving, a lot of folks listening to iTunes, where should they link up with you? So my podcast is called Fundamental Health with Paul Saladino MD. Check me out there. I get other functional medicine practitioners on and people that have interesting conversations about health and wellness. It's not all carnivores. Um, I have a YouTube channel, but probably the main thing is my website, which is paulsaladinomd.com. I'm going to have links there to all my stuff. If people want more, I have an Instagram, which is paulsaladinomd. I have Twitter, MD Saladino, and I have a YouTube channel, which is Paul Saladino MD. You'll find me all those places. That's awesome. Appreciate you coming on, bud. Thanks for having me on, man. Thanks, you, thanks to you all for tuning all the way. And if you liked this video, I'm sure you did. Please hit that like button. You can also share this with someone that you care about if they want to learn more about nutrition. And definitely follow Paul over on Instagram and on YouTube.